Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today we're glad to be joined with Jamie Miller from People Who Think, joining us out from Florida, fresh from the hurricane. Jamie, how's it going? And uh, thanks for joining the program. Now we're doing well. I was just with a couple of our state senators, uh, you know, reviewing damage to hotels out on our barrier islands. And I'm happy to report that I've hopefully by uh, December 1st or certainly by January 1st, uh, people will be back and ready, open for business. Yeah. And I guess for our listeners, can you kind of introduce yourself and kind of tell us kind of sure. what kind of work I'm you do? I'm Jamie Miller. I write a, I write a sub stack at Reasonable Arguments. I uh, work for a political consulting firm. I've been involved in Florida politics mostly for the past 30 years. I'm a veteran of the 2000 uh, election for George W. Bush in the recount. Um, and I'm a former executive director of the Republican Party of Florida and uh, a former senior advisor to Newt Gingrich's presidential campaign in Florida. And I've worked on everything from a rural uh, bond initiative for an emergency room to a presidential race. Yeah. You know, I guess, you know, the politics of Florida, you know, are kind of fascinating. You know, it used to be a, a toss up state, right? 2000, uh, 2004, 2008. Um, everyone was always watching Florida to see kind of which way the country went. Now it's been kind of consistently red. Can you kind of talk to us kind of about the the shift of Florida kind of going more Republican than kind of moderate? Sure. So Florida has has had uh, Republican governance since 1998, which is about the time I, I became professionally involved. We've had uh, a Republican cabinet and Republican state house and state Senate for the last 26 years. and. Uh, part of what you see, I think, is conservative governance and people who are conservatives like that. And uh, certainly in 2020, during the COVID uh, crisis, we people of, of like minds moved here. And so uh, in the past, there was about, an, uh, when I got involved, there was about an 8% Democrat advantage in the state registration. And now there's about an 8% uh, Republican advantage. Wow. That, uh, Really, that that kind of they kind of crossed um, around uh, around COVID in 2020. So it took a long time for that to reach parity, and then Republicans have an advantage in Florida. And you know, it's, it's been kind of interesting. Like I, I remember with the governor's race when DeSantis first ran. Was that was that a close race? Uh, it's extremely close. It was less than thirty thousand votes. Um, you know, we had probably had about eight million voters that year, and. In 2000, the historic recount, there were more than 6 million votes cast and 537 votes uh, separated Al Gore from, uh, from victory. Right. You know, in, in a lot of things, like Florida is kind of a coal area to, to California. Um, they're both kind of coastal. You know, people go there for the weather. But the, the politics are, are, are completely different. And, you know, I always love a lot of our electeds uh, from the Latino caucus go back to kind of national Latino caucus meetings and they meet. Florida Latino Republicans, and <laughs> they're just shocked that that exists. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's kind of kind of interesting, uh, you know, the the uh, coal area and the paradox between there. Um, you know, Florida has been, I guess, in the eye of of Gavin Newsom here the last uh, you know few years. He's taken it as um, his personal uh, vendetta to kind of debate Ron DeSantis and you know go to Florida and take it toe to toe. Uh, kind of how is how is Gavin Newsom perceived there in Florida? You know, he's uh, pursued, like all of you, crazy California. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I think, quite frankly, I think Floridians would have embraced someone like Gavin Newsom more than they would have Kamala Harris. Uh, Kamala Harris has not made any run in Florida at being competitive, whether it's uh, putting financial resources here or uh, spending time or Governor Walls spending time in Florida, it has been off the table and she's done nothing to try to uh, make Florida competitive. I think, it, quite frankly, I, I think a Governor Newsom is the type of person who could have made Florida competitive. We're, we're a very conservative state, but uh, we're also a, a pretty, uh, uh, I don't want to say liberal, but progressive state when it comes to things like ballot access and the ways that you're able to vote and the number of languages in which we print our ballots and, and things like that. We have some of the uh, freest, fairest and most transparent elections in the world here in, in Florida. So, um, so there's certainly uh, room for what I would like to call a reasonable Democrat to 
to garner votes in Florida. Um, but I, the Democrats did not choose that person this time. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. Kind of what what is polling looking like in in Florida right now for the presidential race? Yeah, it's if you ha- if you look at a Democrat pollster, it's still four and a half points uh, for Trump. The uh, most of what I would call nonpartisan polling have Trump leading by about eight to ten points, and then the Republican pollsters are a little bit over uh, a little bit more lenient towards Trump and have them at twelve to fourteen. So. My prediction is both Senator Rick Scott and Donald Trump win uh, Florida by six to six to nine points. But, you know, it, a lot like California, to move a point in California takes millions of dollars. Right. And so Florida is that same in that same unless something happens nationally that really changes the race or turns it on its head. You know, I think uh, Florida's trending towards an eight point win for Donald Trump. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember in, in 2016 when Trump first ran, you know, here being on the West Coast, you get the results a little earlier. And when I saw that he won Florida uh, early in 2016, I, I knew that spelt trouble for Hillary Clinton. Kind of how, do, how does this election compare with that, that 2016? How's the, how does the polling in, in Florida kind of reflect? Yeah, Hillary was competitive here in 2016. Um, you know, Trump won, I think, by less than two points. And then uh, I think it might have been less than one, but it did not go to a recount or anything like that. It was a close race. And uh, certainly in 2020, Donald Trump uh, expanded his lead in Florida to three. Uh, in 2022, Ron DeSantis had a historic reelection. Uh, our three most liberal and largest counties in the state, uh, your your listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with Miami-Dade, uh, Broward, which is where Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach, which, of course, is West Palm, where West Palm is. So uh, and Worth Avenue and some of those places, I'm sure people have visited and loved the shop. The... Um, uh, but out of those three counties, uh, you know, Republicans generally lose all three. And when you combine those three together, Ron DeSantis won them by 5,000 votes. A very, wow. you know, and those three counties represent about the population of a state like Maryland. You know, it's interesting, you know, Ron DeSantis had a lot of buzz uh, for his presidential election uh, early and then faded quite quickly, kind of. What led to his kind of downfall and inability to get any traction nationally? Uh, you know, hindsight, I don't want to see, in this case, probably isn't even 2020. But uh, at the time, I I suggested that if Ron DeSantis was going to take on Donald Trump, he should have gotten in the race early, right on the heels of his historic victory and uh, and ran against Donald Trump. and Or he should have waited until late September and gotten in late in case Trump faltered. And he did uh, split the baby, so to speak. And he entered the race late June. And um, and that was, I thought, poor, the worst timing for him to enter the race. Uh, Donald Trump had, had had established himself as as the guy to beat. He had, he had uh, defeated, or it looked like at that point, for, certainly he was going to defeat some of these uh, political uh, prosecutions. And so he's, uh, it, it just seemed like, and, and to this day, well, maybe not today, but prior to J.D. Vance being um, the vice presidential nominee, Ron DeSantis still polled as the second choice for, for the vast majority, like 80% of Trump voters. So he ran a campaign to, you know, kind of be the second choice of Trump voters, and he was successful. Uh, it's just unfortunate for him that Trump was in the race. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. We had a, a national pollster on in, in April. Basically, what the polls were saying back in April nationally was that um, if it was Trump versus Biden, you know, Trump was was pulling ahead. But if it was Trump versus anyone else, anyone else uh, pulled ahead. And if it was anybody else versus Biden, anyone else kind of pulled ahead. Uh, you kind of see that reflected, right? When when Biden kind of stepped out, him, you know, Harris immediately took took kind of a, a slight lead in, in polls, but that appears to be kind of deteriorating. Kind of what are you seeing in national polling and kind I've, of uh, yeah, I've kind written, of I've written that there's three phases of Kamala Harris. So there's mm-hmm. uh, excitement, relief, and regret. And even during her debate, it was relief. She ended her debate, which is one of the most scripted moments of a debate. And she even said, I think on the Brett Baer interview this week, you know, I'm not Joe Biden and I'm not Donald Trump. And I, I think that's kind of what a lot of her voters are, are attaching themselves to. They're relieved that she's not Joe Biden. 
and uh, they dislike Donald Trump, so they're voting for her. And I don't know that she's made the case that uh, she is capable and uh, of being commander in chief, you know. And I think the polls are starting to reflect that. Uh, you know, there's certainly um, a lot of angst about Donald Trump becoming the president again, but I think there's more angst uh, with her because she really hasn't uh, delivered for the American people. And in the time she's been in the spotlight, she's faltered. Um, you know, making you know making a big claim that Ron DeSantis was politicizing the hurricanes that you know while he was at the emergency center in Tallahassee, and uh, and then Joe Biden almost immediately says, "No, I've been in touch with the governor, and he and I are working on hurricane recovery together." And so the fact that you know she's made those types of missteps uh, do not reflect well on her. And I think those you know they're small; they're not; uh, they're certainly not. Um, suicidal missteps, but I think they are missteps uh, just the same. And people, uh, I think undecided voters are starting to say, well, at least with Donald Trump, I have some certainty. I know what I get. And, right. and I think with Kamala Harris, she has not proven to the American people that, that they are convinced they know what they're voting for or, or, or what she's going to deliver as president. And some people are like, well, I may not even like what I get with Donald Trump, but at least I know. Yeah. And, you know, and that's kind of, you know, what we're hearing a lot, you know, a primary drives out issues, right? And, you know, you get a sense of what people are interested in and what they, you know, you get a mandate. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's clear the issues Trump's running on the economy, uh, immigration, you know, those are th the things he keeps uh, harping on over and over. But on the other side, we, we don't really know kind of what, what the issues are and kind of what's important to people. Uh, and so it kind of brings us to, to turnout. You know, it seems like a lot of voters are apathetic. They don't know, you know, a lot of people don't like Donald Trump and that's kind of what led the election of Joe Biden, right? There's so more people who dislike Donald Trump than people who liked him. Um, and, you know, that's one thing Trump always said is he, he got the most votes of any incumbent in history, which was true. But, you know, there was more people who didn't like him than, than who liked him. Kind of what are you seeing in terms of, of kind of voter turnout there in Florida and kind of nationally? Um, yeah, I think we've seen voting? quite a bit. And the question becomes, you know, uh, where we've seen early voting start, uh, early voting starts in Florida on Monday, and where early voting has started, you've seen record numbers show up to vote. North Carolina, Georgia, I think Georgia started, um, and you've had uh, number, you know, just great numbers. So the question is, are are those folks who have just decided and they're sick of it and they want to be, get it over with, or are those the super partisans on both sides who were always going to vote and always going to vote the way they voted? Right. So are, is it just the cannibalization of of their what would be their Election Day vote? And uh, there's still a lot of theories out there about whether early voting, you know, quote, helps one or helps the other. Uh, but I think it, what it does show is that people are are motivated for sure. Interesting. Because I think or at least the in, polls, the polls yeah. of both parties are motivated. At yeah, the very least. Here in California, I think in, in 2020 and 2022, in those two elections, we had over a million uh, mail in ballots returned at this point. And as of right now, we only have 600,000 at that same point. Um, so it kind of seems like maybe maybe turnout here might be might be slightly lower. Yeah. And, it, and that's, uh, there's a lot of things that, and I haven't really looked at the California, uh, what ballot initiatives you have and U S Senate races you have, but I've predicted for some time that, you know, those secondary races matter in a state. So for instance, in North Carolina, there's not a U.S. Senate race this year. There's only the gubernatorial race. And we know the Republican candidate there stumbled greatly and probably to the point of not being able to recover. And, uh, but then you have, uh, so that those types of races help turnout, right? When, when there's, when there's a close competitive race and, and California is not a statewide where m most races statewide are close and competitive. And so, uh, so I, my guess is that there may have been somebody, something else that was driving voters to the polls in those two elections that you mentioned that were not the presidential race. Right. You know, a lot of people are saying, you know, this this race is going to come down to, you know, Pennsylvania and, you know, one of the swing states of, you know, Wisconsin, Nevada, um, Arizona. 
Um, kind of, have you looked at, at at those states and kind of seen seen polling yeah. on both sides and kind of what are yeah, your predictions? Yeah, the, the polling. Point? You know, the question is, is that, you know, we're late in the game. People are already voting, and you start to create math problems. So if if some, if one candidate is up, and I think in most of those states, you know, the candidates are about tied with, and I think most polling is showing that that Trump is gaining momentum. I don't think there's Nate Silver now. I think has him above fifty percent likelihood of winning. Uh, the electoral college and he he doesn't have them you know he does not have kamala above 60 and winning the popular vote you know so when it's when you start talking about can kamala harris and i think most people you know conventional wisdom would suggest that kamala harris is definitely going to win the popular vote most of us think that that's the likelihood of happening but you know when you start at this point in this juncture people start questioning, oh, she's losing enough. She's leading the popular vote by two points or 1.8. She needs to be in that three to four point raise range nationally to be, uh, to really be competitive. And so, you, you know, she, the air is coming out of the balloon for Kamala Harris and um, places like Georgia, Nevada, North Carolina, you know, Michigan, I think is an Achilles heel for her. Um you know, there's there's an open U.S. Senate race there. There's two open uh, competitive U.S. House seats there. So there's a lot going on in Michigan that can, you know, impact turnout. And so I think that's a, a opportunity for Trump if he's able to. Conventional wisdom would say that Kamala Harris is up two to three points. But when you start looking at turnout in those congressional seats, it it may not play out that way. Yeah, it's, a, it's it's interesting. You know, Saturday Night Live is a great mirror of, of people's feelings and thoughts. Um, and it kind of seems I've been telling people this week that Kamala seems to be getting the John McCain, Sarah Palin treatment uh, where she and uh, you know, Dana Carvey as Joe Biden are, you know, getting the, the center of the focus of, right. of all the jokes. And usually that doesn't, you know, end up well for you on Election Day. Yeah, all, um, all publicity is not good publicity in this juncture of the race. That's for sure. And exactly, like you know, she's doing all these interviews, and they're kind of, kind of, a lot of people are talking about kind of like this death spiral, where you know, the more she, you know, she's trying to get out there more to, to you know, get people you know to know her name and to vote for her, but you know, the more she's getting out there, the less popular she's becoming. Um, is, is that something that you're seeing? I think it's a, I think it was a flaw in her campaign. Joe Biden was able to beat Donald Trump almost exclusively based upon COVID, the economy, and you know that he wasn't Donald Trump. And so the fact that the Joe Biden campaign kind of took over the Kamala Harris race and they really didn't change strategy at all for her, I thought was a big, big mistake. Uh, I don't think they they captured the enthusiasm that she had and and had a plan to ride that enthusiasm all the way to Election Day. And and I don't know if it's that they didn't trust her or if they didn't uh, she didn't trust herself. But she did not make the case to the American people when the American people really cared and wanted to hear from her and really they were, they were excited. People were excited that, you know, she was the nominee and and she I thought she failed in capturing that excitement and letting people know exactly who she is and what she stood for. And um, other than, you know, the what the Saturday Night Live skit, you know, I. I grew up, uh, you know, in a modest household or whatever it is they say. And, you know, and of course, you see the house and it's a four or five bedroom, two story brick home um, that I, I certainly didn't have the luxury of, of growing up in. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, coming out of that first debate, you know, I think a, a lot of people want, th- thought she she won that debate uh, and there was kind of a surge behind her. Why was she unable to get a second debate? So the first debate, I think that part of it was that the moderators were so horrible that Donald Trump's team didn't think they would get a fair shake and because they didn't get a fair shake in the first one. And I think part of it was Kamala Harris. I, I don't know that they actually believe she won that debate. I I called it a draw in my sub stack um, because I felt like Donald Trump won the beginning and the end, which are the two most important parts of the debate. And Kamala Harris probably won the middle. If, you know, we're going to be intellectually honest about it. And, um, you know, so to me, that's a draw. And I thought that she I thought she ended the debate poorly. And Donald Trump ended the debate really strong. And um, so I I felt like it was uh, a draw. But he certainly had to uh, he was erroneously fact checked 
on several occasions where they just they, they set him up with questions they uh, that and then quote fact checked him when he was correct on the facts and so I, I think he felt like I'm not going to get a fair shake so she's not going to get another chance to have the media you know uh, have a two on one again and so. Yeah. Uh, now, if if he ends up losing the debate, that will be something that will be questioned for a very long time of whether uh, he should have done it. But even during that debate, she did not do well in, you know, immediately after that debate, that night, they called for, uh, Kamala Harris called for another debate, which kind of makes you think that she didn't uh, do well. And the other thing that was really odd uh, about that debate was that immediately after it, they released the Taylor Swift uh, endorsement. And if they thought she did that well, they wouldn't have had uh, gone with the cover of a Taylor Swift endorsement sharing the the next day's news coverage. <laughs> that, is, that is interesting. Uh, you know, it, it was kind of interesting, um, you know, before Joe Biden dropped out, you know, you had the assassination attempt. And it seemed like after the assassination attempt, uh, Trump was extremely popular. Uh, and kind of here locally, you know, there was always this talk about, oh, is, is you know, Newsom going to take over for Biden? You know, what's what's the strategy here by the party? Um, and, a lot, you know, I was hearing from a lot of Dem strategists that they didn't see a path to winning um, based on recent polling after, you know, the attempted assassination. Um, then thereafter, you had the Republican convention. And for the first 20 minutes of him speaking, uh, you could tell that, you know, Democrats were very concerned because um, it kind of seemed like, he changed a little bit, but then of course he kept talking and talking and then, uh, you could kind of see his campaign start to kind of lose steam a little bit. Uh, and then Kamala came in and, you know, it was, he went from, you know, kind of leading Joe Biden by a lot to, you know, being neck and neck with Kamala or Kamala being slightly above. Um, can you kind of talk about that kind of transition point and kind of seems like yeah, the less I, he's I out there, the less he speaks, Trump the more popular he gets. Yeah, if Trump uh, goes on, there's there's definitely a line where Trump overdoes it, right? And so, uh, or speaks too long, but is what I mean by overdoes it. You know, the, the convention speech was one of them. Like I said, I've I've written a book, American uh, Speeches That Changed History, that you can find <laughs> on Amazon. And I Donald Trump's not in the book, you know, partly because I, I think you have to have a moment in time and you have to have a... Uh, a little bit of time before you call a speech a great speech, right? Mm -hmm. It has to be a little, it has to season a little bit. And I don't know that he's had a speech that, I don't know that he's had that moment in time or that speech, to be honest with you. But uh, certainly his nomination speech would not enter the book. Like you suggested, maybe the first 20 minutes of his speech. I was at the convention center and saw that speech live. And uh, what you described is what people felt in the room, to be honest with you. And, um, and, you know, people felt like, wow, if he had stopped at even 45 minutes, he, he wins, you know, his first, I think it was 12 or 15 minutes, uh, well documented. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But uh, of him describing that day of the assassination attempt where that was powerful, right. it was powerful. You're in a room, you know, full of at least 15, 20, whatever the thousand people, and you could hear a pin drop. I mean, it was incredibly powerful. And then, you know, he finishes the last 20 or 30 minutes of the speech giving shout outs to Hulk Hogan and you know, other <laughs> professional wrestlers and things. Right. And, and so you're just kind of like, well, where, you know, there's, you know, uh, so if he were to go on to, to lose, I think that would be a moment that people might point at and say, oh, wow, you know, he had this moment. But I will tell you that in my uh, in my blog last October, I predicted that uh, Democrats would wait until after the Republican convention and throw Joe Biden overboard. To me, it was pretty apparent that that was their strategy all along. Uh, I even in my wildest dreams, however, I didn't believe that they would go to their convention and nominate somebody without voting. And in that blog, I also predicted that Chuck Schumer would be the nominee because there's nobody, no better team than Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and no two people better at uh, corralling uh, and counting votes. And I thought that Chuck Schumer would kind of be a person who would come in, look like he has a steady hand on the wheel. And I, quite frankly, I think he would have been a better nominee than Kamala Harris. 
Uh, would he have won? I don't know. He's a pretty liberal guy. Uh, but I think he, at least if the, if the Democrats had gone through some sort of uh, fair, free and transparent electoral process, uh, which they apparently don't care about at all, um, even in our November elections, uh, when they have the Department of Justice suing the states of Alabama to have illegal immigrants, you know, when the state of Alabama takes 3,000 illegal immigrants off their voter rolls and the Department of Justice come in, comes in and sues to reinstate illegal immigrants. And, you know, we're a country that doesn't allow foreign money to influence our elections. I'm not sure why Democrats support foreign votes. And uh, we don't allow tourists to fly here and vote. So I don't know why we would allow uh, illegal immigrants who are not U.S. citizens the, the ability to vote, because they certainly do not have the right. Mm. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the Democrats have always had an advantage on what they call the ground game, getting the vote out, getting people to show up, turning ballots in. Uh, it seems like the, the Republicans have, have taken note of that and kind of started doing something of that their own. And you're seeing, you know, people step in like Elon Musk, uh, you know, sending money to people helping to register new voters and things like that. Um, kind of what are you saying about from the Republicans in terms of a ground game and increasing their ability to kind of be this will be an in, this year will be an interesting case study because it seemed like the parties and the candidates both embraced completely different philosophies. The the Democrats kind of embraced the the traditional more uh, they they mixed in volunteers along with paid workers by the campaign and Republicans seem to have given most of that effort to third party groups and and volunteers and and instead of the campaigns being in control of it. So it it'll be interesting to see, you know, if these states remain close. Um, we're certainly a country that has been used to close elections. Uh, you know, 1948 Truman's win was about 22,000 votes over five states, wow. much like Joe Biden's so in 2020. So um, and, and certainly in 2000, we had five or six states that were separated by about 22,000 votes with Florida making the difference with 537. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people say the 2000 vote was so close because the candidates were so similar. Uh, and if you look <laughs> back politically, maybe they were. Maybe there wasn't really a difference between uh, George Bush and Al Gore. Uh, but today, you know, there's, there seems like a big difference between uh, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. And it's, it seems like four years ago and definitely eight years ago, uh, being a Donald Trump supporter uh, was kind of like taboo. You know, you didn't want to talk about it. People didn't, you know, the polling was off because people didn't want to admit that they were supporting him. Uh, but today it seems like he has a lot more mainstream endorsement, getting kind of more uh, media friendly, getting positive uh, kind of reviews from different groups. Kind of what are you attributing to kind of his, his more, I guess, positive reflection? This well, being a former president of the United States helps. Right. Like that, that offers a level of credibility that that uh, his opponent cannot even as vice president, even as the incumbent vice president. You know, there's a big difference between being vice president and, and president of the United States. You know, the buck stops with the president. And, um, you know, so I think that offers the, the credibility in which you described. Yeah. So here we are about two and a half weeks out. Uh, kind of what's what's your prediction for November 5th? You know, I, I don't know that we'll know November 5th, which is unfortunate. You know, I, I, I don't like the fact that so many states have uh, lengthened their counting process to include days or, or even maybe a week when you think of Pennsylvania. Um, I think the American people deserve better. Um, you know, in Florida, certainly, I think you'll know election night. And we have as more ways to vote in Florida than anywhere else in the world. And, uh, or at least we match other states that offer as many ways to vote as anywhere in the world. So uh, whether it's early mail, in-person, uh, just incredible access to, to voting here in Florida. And my expectation is you'll have a result from 95% of the precincts by, you know, 10 p.m. Eastern here. And, you know, one of the things that we do is we, uh, our canvassing board meets up, meets uh, regularly leading into election day, and they uh, inspect the signatures of mail-in ballots. And so that process that takes 
weeks after the election in other places is done by election day in Florida. And so they open and count uh, those ballots um, prior to the election. And so in Florida, when you start seeing results at 7.05 uh, p.m. Eastern or, or whatever time the computer checks, you know, catches up, uh, sometimes they crash because everybody jumps on there and, and goes to see what it is at 7.01. But um, you will you'll have probably 50% of the votes that are counted and reported before 8 p.m. Eastern. Wow. Um, you know, you said earlier you had a, a sub stack and, and had written some books. Uh, can you kind of tell us, uh, our listeners a little bit about kind of some of your writing and, and some of your sub stacks? Yeah, so I, I write a, a sub stack called uh, Reasonable Arguments. Uh, I also have a website, reasonablearguments.com, but my most current uh, blogs are on sub stack. And, uh, I like to say that I write a right of center uh, blog, but I like to think that I'm reasonable. Um, I think that we've we've allowed uh, our parties to uh, disintegrate to a point where, and part of it has to do with the Citizens United U.S. Supreme Court case, which I know I'm in the minority of, I think, both political parties these days uh, saying we should uh, revisit that case because what we've created is every single politician can become their own political party if they have a rich person who's willing to support them. And instead of money flowing to the party and the party standing for something and people, you know, if you have a Republican by your name, you, you can say, oh, there's probably 80% of these things that person believes. And if you have a Democrat by your name, there's probably 80% of these things that that Democrat believes. And now you have, uh, because everybody can have their own political committee and, and political action committee. And if they have one rich person who wants to give them millions of dollars, they can, they can believe, I don't want to say they, they can believe whatever they want, which makes it sound great. But what ends up, what it has created are these, these polar opposites at the extremes of both political parties and those folks having uh, an oversized mouthpiece because now we have people who are, uh, basically political pundits for clicks. Right. And so um, what everyone keeps asking, like, how are these the only two people in the entire country that we could get to, to vote? Right. For? You know, that's kind of so how everyone feels is like, why are we left with these two people? Well, and it's not, it's not unusual for us. To, I don't think it's unusual for people to think that going into an election when it's, you know, okay, we're, we're kind of in a crappy economy. We're, you know, uh, people, while they think of the first three years of Donald Trump were a very good economy, the COVID year was a horrible economy. And, you know, I don't think people necessarily blame Trump for that, it, you know, looking back in history, but they certainly blamed him in 2020 when the election came around. Um, and, and Joe Biden was able to campaign less than any presidential candidate since James Garfield's uh, front porch campaign of 1880. I mean, that's that's the campaign he emulated. It's the campaign Kamala Harris tried to emulate. And I think Americans are like, no, we need to know more about you. And she failed uh, to do that. I don't think I answered your exact question. Oh, the substack. So the, the book came about. This is actually a fairly funny story. And I talk about it in the book. But um, my wife and I will have our fourth wedding anniversary this December. And when we were dating, uh, she is not a political person at all. And I'm kind of writing all these things and uh, right of center things. And and she's like, I don't understand why you're interested in politics. So I, in all my glorious dating acumen, I uh, wrote her a memo saying, uh, saying, here are 10 great American speeches that inspired me to get involved in politics. And so then I, I started going on the speaking circuit and, and on podcasts like yourself. Thank you for having me. And, and, you know, everybody's on the speaking circuit has a book and I'm like, well, I need to write a book. And so, I was, so it was the middle of the campaign. I'm doing a lot of work for clients, candidates and political parties and things like that. And I thought, well, I've got one kind of written. If I just take that memo, expand it to 20 speeches and then call it a, you know, then write a, a write a book about it. So I, I expanded it to 20 speeches. I give an introduction. I try to, uh, give a little tidbit of information that people may not know about the speech and uh, try not to belabor the point on the bios and all that sort of thing. So, so any of them made in the last 40 years. 
What's that? Were any of these speeches made in the last 40 years? In, your in the last 40 years? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. So the, the speeches include everything from Patrick Henry to uh, Barack Obama. Okay. So it's uh, no particular per political persuasion. Uh, most of them, I would say, are, are a majority of them are presidential speeches, but there's also uh, some great speeches by people like Steve Jobs, Frederick Douglass, and Susan B. Anthony. Oh, interesting. We'll have to more, look more into that. You know, if any of our listeners are interested, please take a look at uh, Jamie's website. Jamie, thanks for joining us so much. Uh, looking forward to see what happens on November 5th. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks for the, uh, the different perspective in Florida. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, everything's different in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think, you know, a lot of people make jokes if you type in Florida man and then, you know, a date, yeah. it'll give you like a great headline. So uh, never short of entertainment there in Florida. We're, we're, uh, we're a pretty inter interesting group down here. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, looking forward to it. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.